All right, 2 Timothy. That's the final letter that we have from the great Apostle Paul. And it was written during his second Roman imprisonment, not long before his execution around A.D. 66, when he wrote Philippians during his first Roman imprisonment, he was anticipating his release. You see that in Philippians 1, 25 and 26, Philippians 2, 23 and 24. Now, however, he's facing the prospect of soon being executed. You see that in 2 Timothy most clearly in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. And the letter is written to to Paul's dear co-worker Timothy, who's probably still in the city of Ephesus, and it's a kind of dying charge to Timothy. Paul sees what's coming, and he's writing to Timothy this kind of dying charge, a letter that's designed to urge him on to faithful and courageous living for Christ. Paul also warns Timothy in this letter about certain false teachers that, who were deceiving people, false teachers that he needs to correct, protect the church against. And when we ended last week, we were looking at chapter 1, verses 3 to 5, where Paul tells Timothy that he constantly remembers him in his regular prayers and that he does so with thanksgiving because he'd been thinking about Timothy's sincere faith. So he prays to God regularly, mentions Timothy, and when he does, he thanks God because he's been thinking about Timothy's sincere faith. And he thanks God for that faith because he loves Timothy, and so he wants good things for Timothy. Timothy's an object of Paul's love. He wants good things for Timothy. And he knows that genuine faith in Christ is the basis of good things. It is the basis of divine blessings. So he thanks God for his sincere faith. And he also knows that but for the gracious working of God, that Timothy's faith would not exist. So he thanks God regularly for Timothy's sincere faith. And in telling Timothy of his persistent thanksgiving to God, for Timothy's sincere faith, Paul notes that he serves Christ or serves God with a clear conscience. So Paul has been faithful to God's call on his life. You know, he can say that. I have a clear conscience. Do you think you're sinless, Paul? Of course Paul knows he's not sinless. But do you see there's a difference between having served Christ faithfully and being sinless? None of us are sinless. But Paul could say, I had served Christ faithfully. He'd been faithful to that call that God had laid on his life. As he says in chapter 4, verse 7, he says, I fought the good fight. I have fought the good fight. He's finished the race. He has kept the faith. So he knew the kind of life that he had lived. He knew that when God had called him, he had been faithful to that. And though he's in prison... He feels no guilt or shame about being in prison because he's not there because of some crime, some criminal conduct, some wrongdoing. You say, well, how can your conscience be clear when you're sitting in a Roman jail? Because I'm sitting here not as a criminal. That's not why I'm here. He's sitting there ultimately because of his faith in Christ. That is what ultimately has driven his arrest. And he adds that his ancestors also served God with a clear conscience. And he's here identifying with the faithful Jewish servants of God in the Old Testament. He's part of their line. You see, he's part of that line of those those faithful Jewish servants of God in the Old Testament. As they suffered for righteousness without compromise, that's what he's doing. So Paul also notes... He also notes that he's longing to see Timothy. And he says that doing so, getting to see Timothy, would would fill him with joy. And you you know how that is with somebody who, you know, certainly the relationship they've had, they've labored together, now they're separated for a time, and Paul just knows it would just be such a great thing to be back with him. And that longing was spurred or intensified by his having recalled Timothy's tears. 
Now, I think those tears probably happened when they had last parted, which may have been when Timothy came over to see Paul when Paul was on his way to Macedonia and Paul told him to remain in Ephesus. So they were parting company then, and I can see Timothy crying. And so as Paul recalls those tears of this, this warm relationship they, they, that they have, that, that spurs him on, or he's thinking about how joyful it would be to see Timothy again. And you can tell this is a very personal and emotional letter, where Paul is just you know, giving his heart to this young, this young man, his co-worker. And Paul mentions, he mentions that the sincere faith that he's so thankful resides in Timothy. He mentions that that also first resided in his grandmother Lois and in his mother Eunice. Timothy's mother is described in Acts chapter 16 verse 1 as a Jewish woman who was a believer, meaning a Christian. And Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.15 that Timothy had known the Holy Scriptures, meaning the Old Testament, from infancy which implies that he was taught the Scriptures by his Jewish mother and possibly by his grandmother, his father, who was Greek, as we see in Acts 16.1. He would have no interest in teaching Timothy the Jewish Scriptures. And one can assume that this sincere faith that was in his mother and was in his grandmother that that influenced Timothy's conversion and was a source of strength in Timothy's life. You know that input that they had to Timothy about those scriptures and the promises. And then here comes the gospel. And so that was a, that was a big factor in Timothy's acceptance and belief that they had prepared him and taught him. And now their faith is a source of strength because they share faith in Christ now. And so that's a, a, th- a great thing. Paul says in in chapter 1, verse 6 to 14, For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but of power and love and sound judgment. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But suffer hardship with me for the gospel in accordance with the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before times eternal, but has now been revealed through the appearance of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. For this reason I also am suffering these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard my deposit until that day. Keep the standard of sound words which you heard from me in faith and love, in in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Now because of Paul's confidence and certainty of Timothy's sincere faith, he reminds him to fire up or fan into flame the spiritual gift for ministry that was imparted to Timothy in conjunction with the laying on of Paul's hands. Now this is presumably the same gift that's referred to in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, where there it's related to the laying on of the elders' hands, suggesting that Paul and the elders had joined together in imparting this ministerial gift to Timothy. And the context of that gift in chapter in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, was that it's a gift of teaching and or preaching. And there in 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul urges Timothy not to neglect it. 
Not to neglect it. Well, here he says essentially the same thing in different words. Rekindle. Fire up this gift that is in you. There he says, don't neglect that gift. Don't let it die out. Don't, let, you know, don't fail to use the same thing here. I want you to be about using that teaching, preaching gift. And the charge to fire up or fan into flame the, that gift, it fits. You see, he says four. He wants him to, to fire that up, to rekindle it. It fits with the truth that God did not give Christians a spirit of cowardice. Okay, I want, you to, I want you to exercise that gift. Be using it, be teaching, be preaching. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and love and sound judgment. See, firing up his teaching slash preaching gift involves utilizing it. It involves proclaiming the truth of God, which is an expression of power, love, and sound judgment, rather than an act of cowardice, rather than succumbing to fear and being silenced. We're preaching it, teaching it, telling it. It's an act of power, love, and sound judgment. And because God has given God has given Christians this kind of spirit, not a spirit of cowardice, but a spirit of power. Timothy's not to be ashamed. He's not to be ashamed of or embarrassed about the gospel message. That's not consistent with the spirit that you have. He's not to be intimidated by opponents of that message. Even if the whole culture is swept up in the idea that what you believe is stupid, it's foolish, it's hateful. You're not to be ashamed of it. You're to present that message and you're to tell it. You see, not to be intimidated. And he said not to be ashamed, not to be intimidated by them, ashamed of the gospel message, or to be ashamed of Paul. Or to be ashamed of Paul because of his imprisonment. It would be easy to be ashamed of Paul because of his imprisonment, especially in that culture. There was a tremendous stigma attached to imprisonment in the Greco-Roman world. It would be very easy to be ashamed of somebody who the society had put in jail and said, you are an enemy of the society. And he says, don't be ashamed of, of me. Rather, in accordance with the power provided by God, he is to suffer hardship with Paul for the gospel. Meaning he is to accept the rejection and the hostility that comes from being a messenger of Christ in this world. That comes with the baggage of opposition and hostility, and he's to accept that, and the hostility that comes from his continuing to stand with Paul in the truth of the gospel. He knows what Paul is there for. He's not going to turn his back and be ashamed of Paul. He's calling him. You have this spirit of power, not cowardice. So you be strong. You use the gift that you have. You teach and you preach. You don't be intimidated. You suffer with me for the sake of the gospel. And you stand with me in the truth of the gospel in my imprisonment. And Paul says of God, he says of God that he saved them and he called them with a holy calling. Meaning he called them to the holy task of spreading the gospel in this world. He has been given that task and Paul and all of his ministry team, they, are, they truly are on a mission from God. God has called them and said, listen, I want you in this world to take this message and disseminate it in the darkness. Spread this light in the darkness. See, in accordance with that, that power, you do that. God's saving. See, they rightly understood that. They had that on straight that they're on a mission from God. And God's saving or reconciling them and anyone else that was not according to their works. That wasn't the basis of it. It was not because they earned 
or achieved their salvation because of what they had done. That wasn't what it was at all. It was rather according to His purpose to save them and all mankind by grace, through faith, in the glorious, crucified, and resurrected Son of God. It is not an achieving. It is not an achieving. It is a receiving. And it's important to have that on straight. And he says that God's saving grace was given to them in Christ before times eternal. Meaning that the plan of salvation was in the mind of God from eternity. He has always seen this. As Paul put it in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, God chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we might be holy and blameless before Him. He said in Titus chapter 1 verse 2, He speaks of the hope of eternal life which the truthful God promised before eternal times. And as Revelation chapter 13 verse 8 indicates, there is a book of life of the Lamb. There's a book of life of the Lamb who was slain. So there's no question about who we're talking about. A book of life of the Lamb who was slain that contains names that were written before the foundation of the world. So this is what he's talking about when he says that that God has this plan, which He was given to us in Christ Jesus before times eternal. That that was always part of the plan. God has this, that this plan of salvation was in His mind from eternity. And this eternal plan of salvation, He says, it has now been revealed through the appearance of, the appearance in history. In human history, through the appearance in history of our Savior Christ Jesus. So in the womb of Mary, in the womb of Mary, God the Son, the eternal person of the Godhead, God the Son became the God-man, Jesus of Nazareth, and fully and perfectly accomplished the redemptive purposes of His Father. The mystery that was veiled for ages, generations, it was concealed. That mystery has been made manifest, broken out into the open in the incarnation, in the appearance of Christ in history, in His ministry, His death, His resurrection, His ascension. It is now there. It's been manifested. It was obscured for so long. But then, there it is. There it is. So this is what he's talking about there. And he says, he says that Christ abolished death in the sense he broke its power. He broke its power in his atoning sacrifice by taking on himself the just penalty for sin. In that, he broke death's power that rendered death impotent for all who are in him as paul says in first corinthians chapter 15 verse 56 the sting of death is sin the sting of death is sin meaning death is a painful experience only for those who are under condemnation for sin for them Death is an entrance into what? It's an entrance into eternal judgment. It's an entrance into eternal judgment. First, into the punitive realm of the intermediate state. And then, into eternal hell. So indeed, it is painful. For the righteous, for the forgiven, for the victorious in Christ, Death is stingless. It is a passage to a blessed intermediate state and then 
to eternal resurrection glory. So this is what he's talking about here. It's in the resurrection at Christ's return that the victory over death that was achieved by Christ at the cross comes to complete fruition. That same word that Paul uses here for abolishing or breaking the power of death, he uses in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 22 to 26, when speaking of the bodily resurrection at Christ's return. He says, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming... Those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. That's this death shall be no more. And then having defeated death through his saving work, Christ revealed That victory. The procurement and availability of immortal life. That is his victory. He revealed that victory through the gospel. Through through the proclamation of his saving work. And those who hear that message, they have its content revealed to them. They have the content of that message brought to light. And those who respond in faith, they receive immortal life. So he says here, and brought immortality to light through the gospel. He procured it. He achieved it. And in that message, it comes to the awareness and people are enlightened when they hear what has been done by Christ in that. And then Paul, Paul declares, he says, he declares that he was appointed, he was appointed a herald, and an apostle and a teacher of the gospel. All right, you remember as the Lord said to Ananias in Acts chapter 9, verse 15, He is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. So that's who Paul is. That's what Paul says here. For which I was appointed. He was indeed appointed. He was called by God himself to be this messenger. And he says it's for that reason, it's for that reason, it is because of his role, his God-given role in disseminating the gospel that he's enduring his current suffering. That's why he's suffering. If you go to the Roman authorities and ask them, say, oh, no, no, Paul's here because, uh, you know, uh, code 409 stroke 9A B7. That's why he's here. All nonsense. Okay, all cover whatever it is. Paul is there because he's disseminating the gospel. He was charged with that. And when you disseminate the gospel into this dark world, the empire fights back. And so that's what Paul is suffering. And that's that's the true reason that he's there in Rome again. He's already been there once. And released, and now he's there facing death. But despite being a prisoner, which as I said, that carried a great social stigma. It's hard for us, I think, to grasp that. What a dirtbag you were considered if you were in prison. So apart from that, see that social stigma, despite being a prisoner, with that social stigma, he's not ashamed. Because he knows who Jesus is. That's why he's not ashamed. He knows who Jesus is. And therefore he knows that faithful service to him is the noblest of things. He knows who he is. So he knows that serving him faithfully, that's the noblest of things despite how the world may see it. Despite that the world may say, that's just crazy, that's hateful, that's this, that's stupid, ignorant, I don't care, fairy tale, whatever it is. He knows who Jesus is. And so he knows 
that serving him faithfully is the noblest of things. And he's not ashamed because he fully anticipates, completely anticipates that his trust in Christ, that his life of labor and consequent suffering. Paul here in the mid-60s, he's been serving Jesus 30 plus years. And I'm talking hard service. Traveling everywhere. As somebody who hates to travel, I can't imagine it. Traveling in that world. But traveling everywhere and being opposed so many times. Being beaten. All that he went through. Just look at his life. Decades. Decades spent serving Christ faithfully and enduring great hardship and punishment for it. But he can say he fully anticipates that his trust in Christ, that his life of labor and the consequent suffering, that that choice of serving Christ faithfully, it ultimately will be vindicated. On the day of judgment, the wisdom, the correctness, the sanity of his decision to surrender his life as a tool of God. That then will be shown. To serve Christ wholeheartedly, the wisdom of that, the correctness of it, it will be evident to all. Everyone will then see, ah, if only I had done what Paul did. If only I had invested in Paul in the confidence, knowing who he is, that he will guard that deposit, that he will vindicate that choice on that day. So you see what a motivation this is. It's because he knows who Jesus is. All of the suffering he endured, all of it will be rewarded. And that's what drives him. And that's what he's doing. That's what, that's what drives him and what motivates him. And he commands Timothy... He commands Timothy to keep as the pattern or standard of sound teaching the things that Timothy had heard from him, had heard from the Apostle Paul. In other words, Timothy's not to be swayed from apostolic doctrine, but he's to stay grounded in it. The things you heard me say, the truth of God that you heard from me, you hold on to those things. You stay grounded in that. And he's to do so in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. He is to fulfill his mission of being a faithful purveyor of apostolic doctrine in a Christian manner. That's how he's to do it. Philip Towner in his commentary says, Faith and love serve as an abbreviation for the authentic life of faith, combining into a unity the dimensions of one's relationship to God and the lifestyle of service produced by that faith relationship. In short, for Timothy to keep the apostolic message and proclaim it, he must at the same time pay careful attention to his own faith in Christ. Now, Timothy here, he tells Timothy that he is to guard the good deposit. He's to guard the good deposit, the sound teaching that Paul has entrusted to him. So Paul has given him a deposit. The apostolic doctrine, the inspired truth of God. I have entrusted that truth to you, and now you are to guard that good deposit meaning he's to prevent corruption of that apostolic doctrine through the influence of false teachers, through people who come in and want to say, no, this is not, I got a better idea, I know this. You just get this. The truth of God. You hold on, nope, nope, that, the truth. You guard that. You hold on to that. Now that we have a responsibility, and he's to do it. He says, do it through the Holy Spirit who dwells in Christians. 
Though we have a responsibility, we as Christians have a responsibility to labor for Christ, to be active in His service. We don't labor alone. We have a responsibility, we have, we have a role to play, but we do not labor alone. As George Knight says in his commentary, he says, Paul can exhort Timothy to guard the good deposit because he knows that the Holy Spirit is indwelling Timothy and therefore will be the one through whom Timothy will be able to carry out the exhortation. So he says, Timothy, I'm not asking you to do this on your own, in your own strength. You are not alone, but you have a role to play. You have to be serious about it. And you have to surrender to the working of the Spirit in your life to achieve what I'm telling you to do. Because it's a war out there. It's a war. And the enemy is clever. And you're going to have to rely on the Spirit. He says in in verses 15 to 18, You know that all those in Asia turned away from me, including Phygelus and Hermogenes. May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he diligently sought and found me. May the Lord allow him to find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well the ways he served in Ephesus. So Paul refers to a time when all those in the Roman province of Asia, the province of which Ephesus was capital, was the capital, they turned away from him. Now we don't know the time or event to which he's referring. And by all those, he's referring to all to whom he might have turned or might have appealed for help at the time. In other words, he's not referring literally to all the Christians in Asia as the following praise of Onesiphorus makes clear. So he's not talking literally about all of them. He's talking about those to whom he might have appealed for help at the time in question. All of those from Asia in that orbit disappointed him. They weren't there for him. Now, he says... It's possible, see, when we say, well, when is this? We don't know, but it's possible that those from Asia who were present in Rome, who were present in Rome at the onset of his recent ordeal, maybe they were the ones who turned from him. So he could say, all in Asia, meaning from, who were with me, they all bailed. And he's disappointed in that. Or maybe it was those in an Asian city. If it is in fact, no, we don't know how Paul got to the second Roman imprisonment. But if he had been arrested in one of those cities in Asia Minor, maybe Miletus or Troas, if he'd been arrested there, maybe it was the Asians who were there at the city of his arrest who didn't do what he needed or or didn't help them in that way. And he singles out Phygelus and Hermogenes When he says here, you know, all those in Asia turned away from me, including Phygelus and Hermogenes. Now he singles them out because their abandonment of him obviously was especially disappointing. It broke his heart to see that. And and I'm sure it broke his heart more because what it reflected about their vision of Christ. That they could be scared off. Or they could be fooled into thinking that Paul wasn't the real deal or whatever it was. But he mentions them here. And so their abandonment was especially disappointing. And this is the only time that these two people are mentioned in Scripture. The only time here we know nothing else about him. And so the Asians who deserted Paul and Phygelus and Hermogenes specifically they function here as negative examples of Christians who shrink back in the face of pressure. You see, so that's how they're functioning in the letter. He's saying, you know, these people, all these Asians here, they turned away from me, including Fida. That was a bad thing. That's a negative example. They were cowardly, contrary to the spirit that they have. That's how they acted. 
But on the other hand, there's Onesiphorus. Onesiphorus, who was from Ephesus, you see in 118 and 419, he didn't allow the shame, the cultural shame that was associated with imprisonment, he didn't allow that shame to deter him from hunting up Paul. And this seems like it must have been a chore where Paul is in the bowels of some place and he's got to go find, where's Paul? They got people stuck somewhere. But he goes and he won't quit. He goes and he hunts up Paul and he ministers to him. And Paul's gratitude is palpable. You can just feel it. And he expresses his desire that the Lord will grant mercy to Onesiphorus' family who are in Ephesus, we see in chapter 4, verse 19, and to Onesiphorus himself. So it's interesting that he has a division between Onesiphorus and his family. So that the Lord will grant mercy to them and to Onesiphorus himself. And it may be that, you know, and this is on the day of judgment, but I think it's, it's Paul happens to know that Onesiphorus is somewhere other than Ephesus. Whether he had just left Rome and wasn't back, whether he was somewhere else. So they're divided, so he says, on his household and on Onesiphorus himself. I think that's the way to understand that. And he adds that Timothy is well aware of how Onesiphorus had served faithfully in Ephesus. So in other words, you know the guy. You know, you know the kind of guy that he is. He labored there with you, and you got to see the reality of his Christian faith, that he's not a poser. He's the real deal. And I'm telling you, he's that. That's what he is. What he was with you in Ephesus, he was with me in Rome. He's a guy who loves the Lord, who searched me out, who wasn't ashamed, ministered to me. May God have mercy on him. Paul just loves it, loves him. Then he says in 2, 1-7, to You therefore, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you heard from me in the presence of many witnesses... These things entrust to faithful men who will be qualified to teach others also. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Likewise, if anyone competes in an athletic contest, he's not crowned unless he competes in accordance with the rules. The farmer who works hard ought to be the first to receive a share of the crops. Contemplate what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you understanding in all these things. So in light of, in light of Paul calling Timothy, calling Timothy to be a teacher and a guardian of the apostolic doctrine. In light of that call and in light of the contrasting examples of shame and courage that he gave in verses 13 to 15, he tells Timothy, Timothy to be strengthened by the grace that is available in Christ. See, proclaiming Christ in an environment where opposition has become intense enough to produce defections from Paul, that requires Timothy to draw on divine strength. You see, as Paul's point man in Ephesus, as his point man in Ephesus, he's going to be the focus of opposition. He's going to face the brunt of it. So he is through prayer and meditation and introspection, and fellowship, he is to open himself increasingly to the Spirit's power in his life. If he thinks he can simply go do this in his own bare human strength, he's crazy. Because it's a spiritual war that's going on. And he is going to need to be strengthened by the Spirit. And that's to draw on the grace of God. To be empowered and to be strengthened. He needs to increasingly open himself to the Spirit's power in his life and his work in his life. 
to become more and more pliable, more and more a vessel of the Spirit's working, that he can have the courage to stand as brothers and sisters have stood throughout history when they're being persecuted and tormented, where it just makes you shake your head and go, how in the world do they do that? They do that because they stand in the power of the Spirit of God. And that's what he's telling him. He's telling him that. You have to do that. And in that divine strength, he's to entrust to faithful or reliable people. He's to entrust to them the apostolic message, the truths that he, he had heard Paul teach in the presence of many witnesses who could verify and vouch for the fact that is indeed what Paul taught. He's given you the truth. He's giving you apostolic doctrine from the horse's mouth. So he tells him, you entrust those things to those people. You entrust it to them. Those who will then be qualified to teach those things to other people. So you transmit it to them. You entrust it to faithful or reliable people who will then be this apostolic message, who will then be qualified to pass it on to other people. And he's urging Timothy, see, to come to him quickly because Paul sees the horizon. And so he wants Timothy to come and get there before Paul is killed. He wants him to come quickly in chapter 4, verse 9 and 21. And he wants to be sure that Timothy's made a concerted effort to entrust the truth to reliable transmitters before he leaves. So I'm sure Timothy's been doing this all along, but Paul's calling him to come to him. So he says, I want you to have faithful, reliable men. And you entrust to them the things that you've heard, the apostolic truth, so that they can then do that to other people. That's what he wants to go on. I've got one minute over here, or maybe less. So I'm tuned in. All right, Paul tells Timothy... He tells him to suffer hardship with him in the manner of a good soldier of Christ Jesus. You know, there's a sense in which that's what we are. We are soldiers of Christ Jesus. Sometimes people say, well, I don't like the militaristic imagery. I didn't write it. You see, we are soldiers. There's a sense in which we're soldiers of Christ Jesus. And Lord willing, we'll explore that next week. Thanks. 